I'd like to introduce Denise Cunningham from the Bonnet House. She has been a professional curator of historical and artistic collections for 39 years. She began her curator curation work after completing a bachelor's degree in fine arts from the State University of New York in Las Waco. She later earned a master's degree in American and New York New England studies from the University of Southern Maine. She has worked in museums and archives in New York, Illinois, Massachusetts, and Maine. For the past 27 years, she's worked with collections throughout Southeast Florida and has been with the Bonnet House Museum and Gardens for 13 years. She's a founding member of the Gold Coast Archivists and serves on the board of the Pompano Beach Historical Society. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here from the Hollywood Historical Society, which has a warm place in my heart. I always loved Hollywood and thought it was a really great city. First plan, plan city, as I just told us in our last talk. But I'm going to talk mostly about Fort Lauderdale and um, Broward County and is that one picture? Okay. Okay, I, I just love this picture because it says trip to the Everglades. <laughs> First inhabitants of Broward County's beaches were the Tecastet Indians and their ancestors, who deftly adapted to the life in a rich and varied environment. Tecastes are roughly translated to the people of the good earth. Spanish explorers passed by the Bonnet House Beach in the early 1500s. In 1513, Holmes de Leon passed the Broward Coast on a voyage south after landing near St. Augustine. And in 1984, we had an archaeological survey done by um, archaeologist Robert Carr, and he discovered conch shelves that were um, split open with metal instruments. So they think that. Um, Common House might have been one of the first areas where the Spanish landed on um, a conch, which everybody liked, especially in the tower. In March of 1838, Major General Thomas Jessup sent Major William Lauderdale, commandeer of 20, 200 Mountain Tennessee volunteers, um, down to the New River, and they followed a Pine Ridge route, which is now known as Military Trail. And together, the expedition encamped in the north bank of the New River at its forks, and that's why the encampment was named Fort Lauderdale after its commandeering officer. He unfortunately went back up to Tennessee and died before he got home. And there were three forts in Fort Lauderdale, and this is a rendition of one of them. Um, and they were located uh, across where Hiamar now stands. And then, uh, used to be because the, the barrier island was so um, remote and there was nobody living there, that the U.S. government later became the Coast Guard, built the Houses of Refuge in 1876. There was five of them along the coast. There's still one standing in Jupiter, and it's a house, it's a museum, so you can come and visit it and learn all about the House of Refuge. Yeah. 
This is a great picture. This is from 1893. And you can see how the it was largely marshland here. There were very few houses. The houses were little squares. And uh, at that time, Broward and Palm Beach counties were both part of Dade County. They split up later. In 1892, a road was completed between Lantana and North Miami. Passengers on the stage line would go on the road, would spend the night at Frank Stranahan's camp. Everybody knows Stranahan House in Fort Lauderdale? That's where they would uh, spend the night and then they'd go across the New River on a ferry and then go down to Miami. And the first train came in 1896 and Henry Flagler was the man who put it through. Um, he was an American industrialist and founder of the Standard Oil Company. He also founded the Florida East Coast Railway, and in doing so, he enabled the cities of Miami and Palm Beach to flourish. The Flagler Estate in Palm Beach Whitehall is today a museum, so you can visit that somewhere. Why does the date say 1920 to 1930? That was, he was born in, oh, oh it should be 18. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I should have had someone proofread this. Yeah. Yeah. He was born in 1920 and the guy lived seven years. <laughs> <laughs> he looks pretty old. Yeah. Yeah. Chicago attorney Hugh Taylor Birch came to South Florida to get away from the crowds at the World's Columbian Exposition, which was going on in Chicago in 1893. Birch and his business partner, John McGregor Adams, purchased three miles of oceanfront along with other parcels in the 1890s. He lived seasonally on the property that is now known as Birch State Park. Has everybody been to Birch State Park? Yeah. Yeah. And this gentleman, his name is Jeff Lockett. And he came to Fort Lauderdale in the 1890s with Georgia Senator Tom Watson. And Hugh Taylor Birch hired Lockett to be his property manager in 1898. Lockett, known in town as Old Jeff, would row his boat to Fort Lauderdale to buy provisions for he and Mr. Birch. Lockett owned a dredge that was used to dredge out the canal and lagoon around Bonnet House. Young people in Fort Lauderdale would sneak down to the front of the house property and try to snitch coconuts. And if caught, the kids would have to sit down with Mr. Birch and Jack, and they would have lemonade and cookies and explain why they wanted to steal the coconuts. And I can't tell you how many older adult, mostly male, but I did have a female last week who said, I snuck onto that. <laughs> and everybody would just, you know, walk by, and it's all like just all vegetation. And you can't see the house or anything, and it sneak over the wall and sneak in and take the coconuts. It was a rite of passage for Fort Lauderdale kids. <laughs> Birch and Adams had a local contractor, Ed King, construct a con concrete block hunting lodge in the shape of a gun on the south side of today's Las Olas Boulevard in A1A. It was named Las Olas after, after Birch and Adams' relationship split up. Um, Adams took over that end of the property and turned it into the Las Olas Inn. Adams sold the property to David Clifford Alexander in 1915, who enlarged it to have a 37-room inn. And I always remember David Clifford at Adams' name because my brother was named David Clifford. Nothing. We weren't related, unfortunately. 
school teacher Ivy Kumari Stranahan arrived in Fort Lauderdale in 1899. She taught for a few years before marrying Frank Stranahan, and the house in which the couple lived is now a museum on the New River. How many people have gone to Stranahan House? Every, everything is related. In 1902, Birch and Adams divided the property. Birch took the northern portion where he built a small house on Granada Street near the beach. He took much pride in planting exotic fruits and trees and coconuts. Birch would travel to Florida with his daughter, Helen Louise Birch, every winter. They both enjoyed escaping their eventful social lives in Chicago for a nice relaxing time in South Florida. The Hillsboro Lighthouse was constructed in 1907 and still shines today. How many people have been on the, on the tour of the lighthouse? Oh, you all should go, it's fabulous. They only had a, a like, I think every other month, but if you check on the Pompano Beach Historical Society's website, it will tell you when the tours of the lighthouse are well worth doing. And this is La Sola's sound back in the early 1900s. There's nothing there. And this is La Sola's Boulevard. It was really nothing more than a sand path. In 1914, the Las Solas Inn was purchased by David Clifford Alexander, who had come to Fort Lauderdale in 1909 to visit his parents and realized the potential for development of the coastal areas he had seen in California during his days at Sanford University. Alexander's new subdivision was called Las Olas by the Sea. He established a street away from the beach with no structures east of the road. This concept preserved the fu for future generations one of Fort Lauderdale's key attractions, still fiercely protected by local residents, a beautiful and accessible public beach. I don't think there's anything else like that except in Boca. South Florida, like I said, you can just go to the beach. The Florida Fruit Lands Company incorporated in 1911 a land drawing they held through several thousands of people to buy lots. Winners had land out in the Everglades and a house lot in Progresso. Many of the lots in the Everglades turned out to be underwater. I love this house. It's a little shanty. Florida East Coast Railway stations were used to ship produce north. In 1911, incorporation of Fort Lauderdale was largely spurred by the citizens' desire for san sanitation. Previously, sewage had been just dumped in the river. In 1912, the New River Canal opened. It allowed boats to go all the way to Lake Okeechobee. Vegetables from the West Broward and Lake Okeechobee were unloaded from boats into rail cars and the Florida East Coast Railway docks in Fort Lauderdale. Much of the high land used for development was made by using fill from dredging. Governor Napoleon Bonaparte Broward ran on this idea of draining the Everglades when he was running to be the governor. And if you look right here, this is the Davy General. Can you see that? Can you see that line? This one. You see in the middle of the picture? That's an outhouse. It gets stumped it right into the canal. 
Settlers were drawn from the rich soil in Davie, and the agricultural area was established early on, like right around the same time <coughs> as Fort Lauderdale. A fire destroyed much of downtown Fort Lauderdale in 1912. The town was built primarily of wood. It was reconstructed with more fireproof materials. In 1913, the Fort Lauderdale Light and Ice Company was established on Northwest 2nd Avenue. The first telephone came in 1914. In 1914, also, a new bathing pavilion was built on the beach north of the House of Refuge. It was named the Casino. It was a double decked building with a dance floor, basketball court, restrooms, and bathhouse. It was destroyed in the 1926 hurricane. Excuse me. And there was a casino here also in Hollywood. You know, you think of casino as a gambling place, but it was really kind of a social gathering place on the beach. The Hillsborough House was built on the beach in 1914, at the time before the 1917 bridge was built. A small number of women tourist colleges, cottages also dotted the beach. The beach was separated from downtown Fort Lauderdale by nearly a mile of mangrove swamp, and the New River Sound formed part of the Florida East Coast Canal and today the Intercoastal Waterway. There was much celebration when the Dixie Highway came to Broward County in 1915. This is the parade through Dania. In 1915, Broward County was formed out of portions of Palm Beach and Dade counties. The first county commissioners were Charles Ingalls, Alexander Lowe, J.J. Joyce, Isaac Hardy, and William Grecknell. The Broward County School Board, Board was also founded in 1915. The first schools in the county were in Pompano and Fort Lauderdale. The first tax collector was William Perry Hill. Citizens were required to pay a $1 poll tax to be allowed to cast their ballots. So that really limited the number of people who could vote to people who had some money. Because a dollar was a lot back then. <laughs> In 1915, the White Star Line operated between Palm Beach and Miami. Broward County's first courthouse on South Andrews was built in 1910 as a school. Aiden Waterman Turner was the first sheriff of Broward County, and he served from 1915 to 1922, and again in 1929 to 1933. Well, we that when he died in 1903. <laughs> Somebody's got to proofread these things. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's just when he served. <laughs> One of the first acts of the new county was to pass a bond issue to fund roads and bridges at Fort Lauderdale, Deerfield, Pompano, Dania, Hallandale, and Baby. The Fort Lauderdale Bridge was an extension of the road known as Ocean Boulevard, which filed past the Springham home through the beautiful oak canopy of Coley Hammock neighborhood as yet undeveloped. In January of 1917, the first Las Solas Causeway was opened to the public, which boasted a hand-operated turn bridge. And you can see that. 
and jump down the bridge. This is the La Solis Bridge. There's really very little development at the time. First light. The first library in Broward County was established by the Fort Lauderdale Women's Club. And there's a clubhouse in the historic, historic building that still stands today. When, in 1917, the United States entered World War I, House of Refuge on the Beach was taken over by the U.S. Coast Guard. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Wallace King, King, who had come to, to the village as a child in 1895, patrolled the beach on a motorcycle. What do you think about that, Clyde? Right on. <laughs> Fort Lauderdale men were ready to volunteer during World War I. Major Will Reed established the Home Guard, which drilled on the school grounds. It was similar to, the, to today's National Guard, there was also Home Guard units in Davy and Dania. Frederick Clay Bartlett and Helen Burke were married in 1919. As a wedding present, Helen's father, Hugh Taylor Birch, gave them a 35-acre house lot that would become Bonnet House. And this is Bonnet House when it was under construction. Bond House was designed by Frederick Clay Bartlett. Bartlett was an artist who loved to design and build things. It was named after the yellow bonnet lily that grows in the lagoon. Still today. Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Helen Birch Bartlett tragically died from cancer in 1925, so she was really enjoyed Bonnet House for a very short time. The 1920s were a boom time for both tourism and real estate investment in South Florida. In 1926 hurricane put an end to the real estate boom and sent the area into a depression before the rest of the country. Port Everglades opened in 1928. <laughs> Frederick Clay and Evelyn Fortune Bartlett were married in 1931. Evelyn had been married before to Eli Lilly of the pharmaceutical family. So everybody had tons of money. <laughs> In 1933, the Florida legislature legalized slot machines, setting a license fee of $50. As a result, this added, added income, many bars prospered greatly during the era, together with drug stores, grocery stores, and even filling stations. The law was defeated in a referendum vote held in the next general election, but the machines remained in place illegally for years. The man who owned a hotel on Las Solas is featured in this picture with his slot machine. The 19th Amendment was re repealed in Florida in 1933, opening the way for many new legal saloons like the 700 Club pictured here in 1937. Wouldn't you like to just sit down there? Visitors enjoyed the temperate breeze of the Gulf Stream on the beautiful Las Olas Beach. In 1935, Fort Lauderdale hosted the first Collegiate Aquatic Forum at the Casino Pool, bringing students to the area and starting what would become later Spring Break, <laughs> which is driving us crazy right now. I don't even go near a one during the Great Depression, many banks and stores closed. People did not have the funds to pay off mortgages or credit tabs at stores. Hugh Taylor Birch helped bail out the Fort Lauderdale Bank. This is the Dania Bank. 
1937, the requirement that voters pay a poll tax was repealed, allowing poor Floridians to have a greater <coughs> voice in government. Supervisor of elections, Easter Lily Gates, pictured here while voting, made a concerted effort to sign up minority voters, and that included both African Americans and Native Americans, who had voted much before. This is um, Birch State Park before Sunrise Boulevard went through the museum. They were just starting to clear it. Um, and a rock road later became Federal Highway. The Navy Section Base was established at Port Everglades in 1942. Seven airfields were constructed around Broward County during World War II. What was once called Foreman Field is now the Broward College. You can see they were in like round shape so that planes could take up all at the same time off the field. During World War II, Coast Guard Guardsmen again patrolled the beach, but then they used horses instead of motorcycles. And this is, did anybody ever remember Helen Landers? She was the county historian. This is her husband, R.L., who was a Coast Guardsman. He painted from Waco, Texas. And uh, when World War II was announced, Everybody went down and signed up to join the military. And RL lived out in the country, way far away from a, a city that he could sign up for. And so once he got there, there was nothing left but uh, positions in the Coast Guard. <coughs> and he'd never seen the ocean. He grew up in Waco, Texas, way out in the country. And so he, he got to Pompano, where he was assigned, and they lined all the servicemen up, and they said, who knows how to ride a horse? And he, and he raised his hand, and so he spent the rest of the war riding a horse up and down the beach here in Broward County. And this is him and Helen over here on the right-hand side, and they, they are trespassing at Ponet House. Yeah. Because this is the Bonnet House room. Mm. And this is the bus terminal in Fort Lauderdale in 1947. Is it still in the same place? I don't know. That's a good question. I <laughs> And this is the Bonnet House site on a topographic map. And you can see this is 49, but it's still largely marshland here, and very few buildings. And the War Memorial was built in 1950, and this building is being revitalized today, and uh, used for multiple purposes. It's nice to see they keep some historic buildings. <coughs> Frederick? Clay Bartlett died in 1953, and Mrs. Bartlett continued to winter at Bonnet House. The Florida State Road Department was responsible for the 1957 construction of the Sunshine State Turnpike, Florida's first superhighway, which traversed the peninsula, peninsula in a north-south direction. Construction started on the tunnel in, the, in Fort Lauderdale in the 1950s and was completed in December of 1960. Originally called the New River Tunnel, its name was later changed to the Henry Kinney Tunnel in honor of the Miami Herald newspaper man who was also a champion of the project. The fuel dock, Pier 66, opened in 1957 and later the first yachts stopped there. The marina eventually grew to 
42 slips. A restaurant and club opened on the first ho in the first hotel rooms were located on a two-story building in 1959. The 17-story tower of today opened in 1965. Cool. Historically, African Americans used the beach where the Gulf Ocean Mile is today. Once the area became developed, they went to what is now John U. Lloyd Park. On July 4, 1961, local NAACP President Eula Johnson, Dr. Von Meisel, and a small group of African American teenagers staged a wade in at the segregated Fort Lauderdale Beach. Their object was the construction of a road to the new Black Beach. The state beach park is now named after Johnson and Meisel. And this is the Bonham House area in 1977. Much of construction has occurred over there now. Eagle and Fortune Bartlett gave Bonham House to the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation in 1983, but retained lifetime use of it for 14 years. So for 14 years, she didn't have to pay any taxes. She was a very smart lady. Um, it's the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation. And we were listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1984. And we were recorded by the Historic American Building Survey in 1985. And Bonnet House Inc., which now runs Bonnet House, we're no longer run by the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation. They were incorporated in 1989. And we were uh, designated a historic property by the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society. And we were accredited by the American Associ Alliance of Museums in 2008, and we were re-accredited just this year, which is a, a great honor. There's only a couple museums in Florida that are accredited. It was a lot of work. We have weddings. We own 700 feet of the beach, which we can rent out for weddings, which is a pain because we have to get all the wedding stuff across to Avon and there's no, no crosswalk there, so you have to kind of dodge, <laughs> dodge the, the traffic. And we have lectures, and a lot of art classes, we do basket weaving, watercolors, colored pencils. And we drive people around in little trams, get nature trail. <laughs> And we have house tours for children and adults. And we have a music series, which is wonderful, that is held at night. And it's really a very special place to go at night. And we have our big Christmas program called Hollywood, Holly, Holiday Magic. And we have art exhibits. And that's Bonnet House and Gardens. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I have a question. It's because um, they have quite a few like devices in the leaves of the temple. And I was curious before um, the you know, that HCM is and everything's open and there's so much marble in there. What do they do with all that storm? Yes. <laughs> it's in my hand. We take everything out of the courtyard and bring it into the house, and then we put shutters up. We have a, a once a, a storm is coming, we have like a four day repair. Yeah, and everything comes inside. It's, it's not what I was hoping that I thought it would be. It is, but a lot of the, the paintings that are outside are reproductions. We have the originals and climate controlled area. But like the carousel animals are a nightmare. 
Yeah. Was there a particular architectural style that the house was built? Yeah. That's a very interesting question. I've talked to architects, several architects, and nobody can really pinpoint it. Well, it's kind of a, called like a plantation Caribbean kind of thing. But um, if Mr. Bartley had, you know, he was an artist, he was an architect, so he just did what he thought was cool. Yeah. Yeah. The bedrooms and baths are in there's five bathrooms upstairs, three downstairs. How many bedrooms are five? Well, the music room or the, the art gallery used to be guest rooms too, wasn't it? Yeah. So there was even more at one time. There's yeah. no bedrooms downstairs. No bedrooms, except for the music room. And not where the where the art studio that used to be a wing of guess but you weren't you weren't very important if you stayed over there I understand yeah, yeah. if you were in the house you were a really good important person they put the yeah. lesser like the B crowd was in that other wing well, back then. I've known Small he was actually hired by Mrs Bartlett right out of book school <laughs> right out of diapers anybody else okay well thank you so much for coming. I just wanted to get a wonderful story for the bonnet shop. This is a special horse that's called a mustache. It has like a handle on it. Are you kidding? It's true. I know what the last one is.